I got a call one day at work, and it was the FBI. They wanted to talk to me about uh, my connection to the Soviet Union. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. The Chinese army, the Chinese police are advancing through the city from a variety of directions on Tiananmen Square. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Robert Pershman describes himself as an anti-Cold War activist. His political views started to be formed while serving in the US Air Force during the Vietnam War period, where he saw firsthand the toll of casualties in the US military, as well as racism that was prevalent in the American South. An interview with a Soviet journalist which was broadcast on PBS radio, the US equivalent of the BBC, was the catalyst for almost a one-man campaign to reduce tensions between the two superpowers. At this point, Robert was working as a US mailman where he financed numerous visits to the Soviet Union to foster a better understanding between the two systems. He became friends with many Soviet personalities, including Dean Reed and legendary Soviet journalist Vladimir Pozner. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a written review in Apple Podcasts or share us on social media. And if you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute at least three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Larger amounts are welcome too. Plus, you get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a monthly financial supporter and you bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So back to today's episode. We welcome Robert Pershman to our Cold War conversation. I, my father was a pharmaceutical salesman, and uh, when I learned to drive when I was 15, he sent me out on Saturdays to deliver drugs, and that's where I was listening to the radio when I heard about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, kind of jolted me. And uh, I don't think it's ever been out of my mind since then. It's always right there. Right. And and at that time, were, were people aware of how scary that situation was? I think so. I think definitely, yes. That was my experience. You then went on to join the uh, the U.S. Air Force, I believe. That's right. I was in the Air Force for four years, and uh, it was quite an experience. I learned a lot. I went, went to Greenville, Mississippi, lived in the South, and uh, learned about uh, racism in the South. And uh, while I was there, I went to uh, a uh, concert that we got free tickets for four from the Air Force for Nuriev and Fontaine that were dancing at uh, outdoor uh, park. It was a site of a World's Fair. And uh, uh, that is one of my early memories of being drawn towards uh, uh, interest in the Soviet Union, because I thought to myself, well, these people are, are have such interest in arts. How can they be uh, so bad, uh, as I've been told? And, uh, well, that experience was just magnificent. There was the outside, like I said, and whirring fans on a hot night and oak trees growing out of the stage. And uh, my interest in ballet grew uh, enormously after that. And uh, as I traveled about the Soviet Union, uh, I was I met all kinds of artists, dancers, musicians, opera singers, and that was one of the bonuses for the work that i did right and and we will we will come on to that in in depth i'm surprised at a a a concert for the military with nureyev and fontaine i can i can see bob hope 
But that seems like an yeah, unlikely yeah. duo. <laughs> yeah, that's true. However, it wasn't for the military. It was just that the military was issued free tickets for things like this. And very often they'd have a, a hard time uh, getting people to take them. But, uh, I went with uh, three other soldiers. Why did you decide to join the Air Force in the first place? I was in the position of uh, being unqualified for a good job. And just like so many people who joined the military, I did it for a job. And uh, that was before I became a peace activist. I think my career as a peace activist started about four months after I was in the Air Force. And before I I left, I was a member of the American Friends Soviet Service Committee, which is a very prominent peace organization during the war. And I learned a lot from them, a lot of techniques and ways to try to influence people. And I started before I was out of the Air Force, and that could have got me in trouble, except I was so appreciated for the work I did in the Air Force, which was sitting at a desk uh, looking busy, basically, uh, with statistics uh, and an adding machine. And our job was to help the Air Force keep pilots from getting out of the Air Force. And uh, and, I, and I felt so much sympathy for these officers who were pilots in Vietnam. So I was hardly the, the guy to be uh, keeping them in, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And di- did your views change when you were in the Air Force or, or, or did you have views around peace acti- activism prior to that? I did not. I I was uh, troubled by uh, racism. I was troubled by Cold War. The fact that the Cold War had been there since I was a child and my early memories of 1950s, you know, under practicing for bomb uh, air raids and having air raid drills. And they used to call we have a tornado warning system in Minnesota and uh, they used to call it the air raid siren you know until uh, i don't know 20 years ago and within the air force it, it sounds like there were others who thought along similar lines to you as well i met many yes and i uh, one of my jobs before i was doing that statistical job i interviewed uh, high-ranking officers i got the job mainly because i wasn't afraid of generals uh, I, I could speak comfortably to them and I liked them actually, you know, and they liked me and I, and my job was to make sure that their military records were accurate and they confided me uh, about their worries and concerns. And uh, so I was was kind of tuned into the angst of uh, military members who were actually fighting and flying. And the base where I worked for that was uh, in California was Travis Air Force Base. And we had the uh, hospital where the injured came and the morgue where the bodies came. Right. So you could actually see the toll that the Vietnam War was um, taking on the U.S. military. That's right. That must have been very, um, very sobering for you. Oh, it was, yes. And you, you mentioned the the racism that was in in the South during that that period. Can you give me any insight into what some of your experiences were? Well, yes, I it, you know it was the first time I had a heavy duty exposure to uh, black people for one thing, and uh, I had many friends who were black, dear friends who lasted beyond the Air Force, and there I was in Greenville, Mississippi, where the colored Drinking fountains still existed and signs all over the place. And uh, uh, I remember being in a dry cleaner because our uniforms were hard to make them look good. And we used to go to dry cleaners that were right on the base. And uh, I remember uh, the clerk who was helping me apologized for me having to wait for that <laughs> who was ahead of me in line. And uh, that struck me. Uh, I used to go into town, into downtown Greenville on the bus from the base. And uh, I loved the town. Uh, It was such a new thing for me. And and yet the racism was everywhere. And uh, 
we were advised not to to go to town with other uh, with black or mixed racial company. That was the policy, and it was sometimes ignored uh, by me. And uh, I used to go to the town every weekend and spend the weekend at a hotel just to get away from the military. And it was still one of my happy memories. It was, and that's another funny thing about Greenville is. Many years later, while when I became the uh, anti Cold War activist, I went back to Greenville on the Mississippi Peace Cruise, which was uh, a big deal in this country to, to end the Cold War. And it was 50 Soviet people were on the uh, Delta Queen riverboat when we traveled from uh, St. Paul to St. Louis in 1980. Six and then in '88 we traveled from St. Louis to New Orleans, and uh, Greenville was one of the stops. And uh, I managed to see the same hotel I used to go to. The base was has was closed at that time, and uh, my daughter was with me. My daughter was uh, we adopted her from Korea, and uh, the mayor of Greenville was black. And we were uh, on the shore of the river, the Mississippi River, and uh, my daughter was welcoming people from other river boats. And she had picked up a southern accent on the boat, and uh, <laughs> it was very cute. She, I, I'm trying to remember her exact age. I guess it must have been seven. But uh, she was shaking hands. She's copying the mayor, the black mayor, and she's saying, welcome to Greenville pronouncing it the way they do, Greenville. Yeah, so times have definitely moved on then since uh, your last visit. Yes, yeah. And um, so you would have been in the military when President Kennedy was assassinated as well. Yeah, you? that was a big deal in my life. I was, uh, on the day that he was killed, there was a big storm. There was so much rain and I was on duty with the, base commander it was the little shack it was a, the base didn't do much it had originally it was a place where they trained jet pilots and by the time i got there it was for training people who operated typewriters like me and also firemen and anyway i was on duty uh with this young captain who was the highest ranking guy on the base and uh he and I both heard the radio uh, announcement that the president was dead, and uh, the two of us dealt with it. I mean, he he was upset. I was upset. And those days that followed, you know, were uh, the uh, killing of uh, the assassin uh, that took place. That was all intelligent. We all paid attention to it. Yeah, because there, there was, you know, they were trying to say that Oswald would had been influenced by the Soviets as well, because he'd lived in the Soviet right. Union for a while. Yeah, that was an interesting story. Yeah. I followed all that, and conveniently now I'm starting, it's starting to fade away from my memory. Kennedy's assassination is one of those moments where people remember the, you know the day and the time and exactly exactly oh, when they yeah. heard and it's it's interesting to hear to hear from you your experiences there a lot of things happened to me in those few months that i was in greenville I, that's where i really connected with uh, martin luther king he had won uh, it was time magazine's man of the year and he had won some prize and uh, i found myself defending him because there were so many white racists in the air force that were amongst me and that's where I got the nickname Rev from black people because I was kind of preaching to people about Martin Luther King's message. Wow, that's that's quite an honor to be given that. Um, I thought that I name. Felt very honored. <laughs> yeah. So, did you decide to leave the Air Force because of your your views? Essentially, I had no intention of staying in, although it was a long. Uh, enlistment it was four years and uh, in those days you felt like it was better to enlist than to be drafted because draftees tended to end up in Vietnam with guns and there I was in California at a 
one of the first uh, computer typewriters, the IBM Selectronic, which had a memory. And I also helped the Air Force change their records from manual paper into computer cards, which was kind of exciting at the time. I was all new. Yeah, no, those early days of the uh, of the computer were were a very interesting time. So w- when you left the Air Force, what where did you move to and and what did you do then? Were you married at that point? I went back to Minnesota, went to the University of Minnesota briefly until my money ran out. While I was in the Air Force, I worked nights at a restaurant, in an Italian restaurant for <laughs> people that kind of had a gangster look to them. It was Polly and Tony and uh, this <laughs> giant restaurant. And uh, uh, that's where I made extra money. And it paid for uh, maybe, I think it was two semesters at, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Then I was off to California back there because I liked the Bay Area so much. And uh, I first place I lived was in California was San Francisco in an apartment. I was only there for about three months. And then I went to uh, Marin County, which is 18 miles north. And it's a paradise. It's where the Milwaukee Indians lived uh, in total peace before uh, they were interrupted by civilization that came to California. But uh, I loved it. And uh, that's where I worked for the post office for seven years before I moved back to Minnesota. And I did get married while I was there. I married, uh, I was married for two years to one person who was the mother of my son, who went to my care after her. And uh, he still lives in Minnesota, lives uh, 10 minutes from my house in one direction. My daughter lives 10 minutes the other direction. And I see them all the time. Mailman for 34 years. Wow. Wow. Um, Let's move on to, you know, the the extension of your anti-Cold War activism, because I believe in in 1980, you heard something on the radio which uh, sent you in a different direction. Yeah, that's kind of one of my key stories is the fact that uh, I'm a big radio fan listener. I have been almost all my life. And, uh, you know, in California, I listened to broadcasts from KPFA, very famous uh, Berkeley radio station, and also from University of California. Learned about uh, Chile from uh, firsthand stories about what happened there under Allende and the, the death of Allende. Hmm. The radio guy I listened to. The, he was a professor at UCLA, and he was really good. But anyway, the radio listening just went on and on. And uh, I was at I was sorting mail at the post office here in my hometown, Chaska. And I listened. There were I listened to public radio, which is kind of like BBC. It's they had uh, a journalist from Radio Moscow was talking and. Uh, he talked for a full hour, and I listened to every word of it, and uh, I later got a recording of it because it was so important to me. But he, he just challenged uh, Americans to that we didn't know anything. You know, We act like we know what we're talking about, but we never paid any attention to actual Soviet people. We just listened to people who didn't like the Soviet Union. So that was the message that got through to me. At the same time, there was publications. Uh, or things I read here locally uh, in Minnesota about an organization called the Minnesota Council of American Soviet Friendship. There's just by chance with an article. So I called that, a man who was written about in the local paper, and he told me about what he knew about the Soviet Union and suggested that I should go there. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to him until a year later. And uh, I made my own plan, and uh, well, I, I didn't know how to get there. You know, I called travel agencies, and they couldn't tell me. And I called a Canadian uh, travel agency, and oh yeah, they were able to connect me. And I set out for uh, 
Moscow in February of 1984 from Montreal on a brand new Soviet plane. It was, uh, it impressed me because it was new, I guess, because I told people later, gosh, that plane was so fancy. And they laughed at me like, what do you mean? You're talking about Aeroflot? And I said, yeah. But it was just a chance thing that I got on a brand new plane and it, it showed. And they said, they seated me with a young man named Vitaly Churkin. And I took, you know, I, my intent was to interview people. And I had written down a, an introduction in Russian language that I could hand to people. I had many copies of it. It was brief, you know, a half a sheet of uh, notebook paper. He was delighted to talk to me and taught me about uh, Soviet toast, introduced me to other people on the plane. The plane apparently was full of VIP Soviets going back home. Interesting thing about him is later, uh, years later, I would see him on television being interviewed. He ended up being the uh, uh, Soviet ambassador to the United Nations. And uh, he had that job until just a few years ago when he died. And he was highly respected and lots of affection for him by people all over the world, which delighted me, you know, to see that development. And I was really sorry to see him die. He died very young. Robert, I just wanted to ask you a couple of a couple of questions about sure. that trip before before we go further. So were you sympathetic to the ideology of the Soviet Union as well at this point? Yes, I was. Uh, I can't remember if I joined the Communist Party before that trip, probably just after it would make more sense. Uh, and I didn't join the party because I was excited to be a communist. I did it because, well, I guess that doesn't answer your question, though. Uh, the question was, yes, I was sympathetic. I'd already read uh, Soviet propaganda, which was good. I mean, it said why they exist, and they emphasized the fact that uh, they had all these people uh, that they had to unite. You know, there was so many nationalities, over 100 nationalities and languages, and so many people had been at each other's throats for uh, centuries, you know, just all kinds of old hate. And I saw some of it, some of it up close, the, the hate, uh, and that's another story maybe we'll get to, but I understood what socialism was supposed to be, and it sounded great to me because I was already, as a young 19 year old uh, i was questioning capitalism mm -hmm. and uh, uh so anyway here i am i can't remember my age in 1984 but uh, 30s i was older than vitaly churkin the un guy yeah but I, yeah, I was open to everything, and uh, and yet I wanted verification. Sorry, I just want to. So, so you are. I was going to say just, but you're a regular guy working for the U.S. Mail on a one-man peace mission to the Soviet That's Union. Correct. Yes, I was already a Radio Moscow listener. You know, I listened from from the time I I heard Joe Adamov, and I sent him many letters. He answered my letters. He spoke to me on the radio. I might forget the story at the time that uh, I was visiting Radio Moscow Studios, sitting at Joe Damoff's desk, and uh, he told me about all the people that uh, he had interviewed. And it was a long list of presidents and congressmen and people from all over the world, famous artists. And he said, but yours, yours is the only picture on my desk. And it was a picture of me that I had sent to him. And he liked me because I, I broadcast his words. You know, I wrote about him and I learned about uh, uh, the Soviet Union from Radio Moscow. My wife won the, uh, a contest called the World Youth Festival Contest in 1985. And she won a trip to the Soviet Union. And while she was there, Joe Adamoff would address me and tell me how she was. He, I, and there I am at my wife's mother's house with my shortwave radio, which nobody I knew was 
had the patience to listen to shortwave, but I told them what they were saying, that uh, they were saying, Kathy's fine. We tried to reach her at the hotel, but we, we couldn't until later. And But she's fine. Don't worry about her. <laughs> so that was kind of fun to have that happening on uh, wow. and, and through shortwave vi- service. And, and through Vitaly and through um, Joe Adamov, is that how it sort of let you manage to network your way into other people from there? Yeah, it just kept happening. People would introduce me to others, and Joe or uh, Vladimir Posner, who was very prominent in our country uh, in the eighties, he still is. He's still he's eighty two years old now. And he's still uh, you'll see him on uh, YouTube all over the place. You can see him. He does great interviews. Uh, famously interviewing uh, Hillary Clinton several years ago. I was fond of him. He came to Minnesota. I went to the airport to pick him up at the airport. My daughter met him. I have lots of pictures of him with my daughter. My daughter gets on the knees of a lot of Soviet people like cosmonaut uh, Georgi Gretschko, a famous guy who was really a delightful man, came to the United States and traveled on the peace cruise. uh, And I spent a lot of time with him. But he... Related to my daughter. My daughter uh, was on Soviet television singing Moscow Nights. They, they recorded her uh, on the riverboat. When you landed in Moscow, I mean, did you know where you were going to go or where you were going to stay or, or what? Yeah, I had a I had bought a, a tour, uh, which included a guide in every city I went to. Most people who go on tours go on group tours and then they have an escort somebody who goes with them from the united states and that's what i did for my subsequent trips i would be the escort for the trips i made after this first one and it resulted in i was very proud of what i was able to do because tours of the soviet union were pretty in my i call it boring they were brought to famous places and people come back with pictures of famous buildings and statues and what have you and museums. Uh, but my objective was to get uh, my guests to go into Soviet homes and uh, they used to tease me, uh, guides that knew me, they would uh, make announcements on the bus and say, now we're going to Robert's dear friends in Balieva. And, uh, the bus would pull up uh, many blocks away near, at, at the place where the the uh, train or the subway would stop, and we would walk a long way to uh, the apartment. And it was my job to get them there in the snow, friends' houses, and I brought them to homes in uh, Leningrad and Moscow and uh, Minsk and also in uh, Yalta. Simferopol, actually. It looked just like uh, Northern California, where I lived for all those years. Right, right. And d- did the, the Soviet Union live up to your expectation, or, or did you see things it that you thought? It exceeded my expectation. I was, I was totally uh, in love with the people and the life and the attitude of people. You know, uh, people didn't seem to be... Uh, burdened by labors as much as I was. I mean, I worked so hard for the post office and uh, I was so weary uh, when I'd get home from work. Uh, all those years, there was no year that was easy at the post office. And uh, it seemed to me that Soviet workers were happy with their lives more than I was. And on the other hand, in Soviet life, there was an awful lot of products that were uh, produced. You know, people go, went to work and made something they didn't really believe in, and it would be duplicated a million times, and you'd have lousy watches, lousy shoes, lousy clothes, and uh, I imagine that didn't help much. I was always proud of the post office for being the best in the world, and Russians couldn't be proud of, a lot, of many of their results of their labor. Right. And what what was the housing like that you were seeing in the Soviet Union? The nicest home I ever visited was the home of a famous 
opera singer who also was a member of parliament. Uh, his home was, to me, it was a mansion. It was, it was a, a, a four or five story building that uh, he had one floor of it. Uh, and it was gorgeous. I brought tours to his house and we sat in a giant dining room bigger, you know, it was like an institution. And lots of art on the wall. He sang for us, lectured. He's still alive. He still, uh, he teaches music now. He doesn't live in the Soviet Union anymore, like somewhere else, I think Germany. The other housing, right? Well, yeah. I saw some real basic living and I think the, the most basic living I saw was a uh, a mo- woman who worked for Radio Moscow. She had come to Moscow and married a uh, Russian man, and uh, she still lives in the same house that, that, that I visited many times. And her son lives here in Minnesota. He's a prominent doctor, but their home was really basic. I mean, it was things that you'd associate with, I suppose, a, a bunkhouse or something. Just really basic, the little, tiny little kitchen, tiny little living room, a bedroom, a bathroom the uh, size of a bed. And, right. and yet, happy people. And uh, it, one interesting story that I might forget if I don't say it now, this person was dedicated uh, communist. And now that's all in the past. And she laughs about that time and calls it the time we were building communism. And I laughed too, because I, I felt like I was helping build communism too. And I, I stopped building communists, communism the same time that uh, Vladimir Posner did. He quit the party and, and I quit the party the same year. Right. Well, yeah, I, I, I want to talk about that. How did your workmates back in the, the U.S. mail in Minnesota react to your trips to the Soviet Union. Yeah, that was fun in that uh, I was treated very well. I mean, my bosses were helpful. They knew what I was up to, and they let me have vacation when I asked for it. We call it leave, and it's very generous leave, and I used just everything I had for uh, uh, the cause, and that's why I got burned out, out you know, and I had to quit uh, well, I would have been dead if I'd kept that up, that level of uh, work up. But my coworkers were very friendly about it. I would bring them, I brought back audio tapes and I had people listening to my tapes uh, while they worked because that's what you could do while you sort mail is listen to a radio on a headset and they would listen to my recordings of that I'd Everywhere I went uh, on my first trip in 84, I would set a tape recorder on the table and record everything. So I have, I don't know, I have over 100 hours of uh, recordings of conversations at tables. I brought uh, Soviet guests to uh, my hometown and took them to a restaurant and things like that. And they loved it. Uh, And I introduced... uh, loads of Minnesotans to Soviet people. That was one of the big things I did was not only did I go there for those trips, but I helped uh, welcome guests from the Soviet Union to Minnesota. And there were many big delegations, uh, which included great artists and newspaper people, mainly newspaper people. I had so many newspaper contacts, you know, Pravda, was one big one, and that, that's why I was I published uh, a letter encouraging Gorbachev to visit Minnesota that was published in Pravda, and I got credit for from the governor of Minnesota for for that, and uh, he came to Minnesota. It was a big deal, Gorbachev coming to Minnesota. Wow! As Sorry. a result of your letter, <laughs> well. I think he might not have come. He came, uh, I mean, it was probably suggested to him, and on my letter that was published in Pravda, and I knew the thing you know about Pravda is the head of the Communist Party is going to read every word of Pravda every day, and that's true. And the Pravda is not a big newspaper. 
So that's not a big deal for him to have somebody read it to him or something. So he, he saw the letter. I, it wasn't signed by me. I was nobody. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I was somebody who could write the letter and have it translated into Russian and have it signed by the chairman of the Minnesota Council of American Soviet Friendship, who was a dear friend of mine. So she signed the letter and it was published. And uh, uh, even the re uh, local uh, people who didn't like our governor, uh, Governor Prokovich at the time, uh, they even gave credit to me for uh, that letter. I mean, they actually called it the, to the attention of the governor that was a opposition Republican who. Wow. Now the other story about uh, acceptance at work was uh, uh, I got a call one day at work, and it was the FBI. They wanted to talk to me about uh, my connection to the Soviet Union, and I said, "Well, you can call me at home. Don't call me at work, please." And they said, okay. And I got home and they didn't call me. They were, they came, I, they asked me when I'd be home and they were there when I got, when I got home and I invited them in and uh, they asked me questions about why is this, why is a mailman being written about in Soviet newspapers? And uh, I told them the story. I told them I was not uh, an enemy of the United States. My objective was to encourage the Cold War to end. And uh, they asked me if I was a communist, and I told them it was none of their business, and they accepted that. And uh, my wife took notes for the whole uh, meeting, and they were very friendly. They were young, and uh, my kids were sitting at the top of stairway watching as this went on. And uh, uh, my, the effect it had on me was I liked them and I didn't feel intimidated by the FBI. I felt like they were on my side. They're not always on the side of the people, but in this case, they were certainly nice to me. Some would say a corresponding visit from the KGB wouldn't be as uh, pleasant. Right. Uh, oh, although I did, uh, I'd have to say that People didn't introduce me themselves to me as members of the KGB, but I think I developed uh, an eye for it. And uh, the people that I thought were KGB were very nice people and uh, very hardworking people. And uh, they really treated me with respect. I get, well, why wouldn't they? I mean, they saw that, uh, that I was trying to help the situation. And... I know, you know, I know all too well about, things, you know, the, the, the things KGB did that w wouldn't, were not pleasant. And, uh, you know, I have all kinds of opinions about Stalin, for instance, and I'd always ask questions uh, uh, of Soviet friends. And the story one guy told me was, yes, when I was a child, Stalin was God and uh, I didn't realize that wasn't true until long after after he was dead. But the good thing about Stalin was he helped end the war. You know, the not the worst thing that ever happened in this world. Uh, well, I, I've changed my view on that now because there are worse things that have happened since. But it was the uh, Nazis, and uh, I thank uh, Stalin for being part of the ending of the war. But nothing else. I can't think of anything else I thank him for. You also become sort of like the go-to person for local radio and TV if they want to speak to somebody about the Soviet Union. Yeah, and that happened kind of. I don't know why it happened or how it happened, but I started getting calls. I guess it was because it was different to what I would say would be different from uh, angry bad Soviet Union talk, you know, it was me trying, you know, like trying to explain the, what I could about uh, the uh, Korean airplane being shot down. All I could do was repeat what I had heard on Radio Moscow, which was something nobody had heard. So it was interesting to hear what, what they said on Radio Moscow about it. Uh, and there were many other, all those, every time there was something, I'd get a call.
And then I I did a lot to we my wife and I made my wife was with me on this trip by the way I'm I'm not on the travel but uh, on uh, being an activist she is very good at it and both of us worked full time during the period she's a librarian she's the person I went to first to get you know I asked her to give me some books written by Soviet uh, authors uh, about the Soviet Union, and she couldn't find anything at first. I, d- I was going to ask you about the various personalities you you met in in your travels as well, because I understood that you met Dean Reed. Dean Reed was a fun event. Uh, we were traveling from uh, Simferopol to Moscow. The our, our Soviet guide working for in tourist was uh, a mother who was Jewish, and I liked her a lot. She liked me, and she excitedly told me, she was sitting close to me on the, the, the biggest Soviet, the biggest plane I think that's ever was a passenger plane. I can't remember what it was called, but uh, it was like a flying gymnasium with seats. And uh, we were near windows on one side of the plane, and... Uh, she excitedly told me, Dean Reed is on this plane. And uh, I knew who Dean Reed was at this point because I'd read all about him. But the first time I heard the term Dean Reed, I heard Jean Reed, and I thought it was some Russian word. I had to look it up, and I got help to do who he was. And, but here, this woman is saying, he's on the plane. And where is he, I said. And she said, he's on the other side. And I said, well, I'll go over there and introduce myself to him and I'll bring him over to see you and she said oh no she's holding me back and uh, I proceeded to do it I walked over there introduced myself to him and I recognized him from uh, pictures I'd seen of him and um, video and um, he was very interested to meet an American who knew who he was that was something he wasn't used to and uh, I told him about the uh, interest guy on the other side of the plane and he came over to meet her and she was so excited and he was gracious shaking hands with all my tourists and uh, uh, we talked a long time and then the plane landed and we were under the wing of the plane it was raining in moscow and he was carrying his guitar we talked a long time and there's a picture you'll see of me on uh, the dean reed website Anyway, a uh, picture was taken of Dean and my wife and I by uh, one of my tourists uh, with my camera and made it easy for me to get the film. And then we talked for a long time because one of the things about Soviet travel was uh, you, you spent a lot of time waiting at uh, airports and for ground transportation and for the next flight. Yeah, so anyway, I got to know him. He told me uh, that he was coming to Minnesota soon, and he told me about a friend he had in Minnesota, and I knew the guy very well, who was also a peace activist. Uh, he was known for uh, opposing the Honeywell Company's partic- making of weapons, and he died recently. Um, anyway, being... Uh, came to Minnesota and I uh, escorted him to various meetings. Yeah, I brought him to the local TV station. I brought loads of Soviet people to TV and radio interviews. And uh, one of them was that opera singer who sang uh, my favorite aria from Aida to me as I in the back seat of my Volvo as I drove him over to the radio station. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite memories because I'm an opera nut and a ballet nut. And uh, to get connected to all these Soviet artists and to the famous uh, theaters in uh, the Soviet Union. like I have a long list of people that I met, like uh, Nikos Sidorakis, who uh, did the music for Zorba the Greek. Most people know that. He also did a an opera uh, to the uh, poetry of Pablo Neruda called uh, Canto General. And 
I got to shake hands with him as well as John Randolph was a famous uh, movie actor who headed the National Council of American Soviet Friendship. John Randolph was a great American actor and he was blacklisted for a while because he was a commie for a while. I bought many copies of a book of Savitsky paintings and I learned quickly that when I had that book with me, when I traveled through customs, they looked at me with a different eye, like I was some not your usual traveler. It was almost like my key to yeah, a little extra res- respect. And Savitsky, it was an artist uh, who uh, was very famous, uh, and he was uh, in a concentration camp, and he was a painter, and he was famous for his paintings of uh, Holocaust victims as saintly, beautiful human beings, really beautiful pictures of them. And the Nazis were caricatures of uh, very, of evil. And you have paintings called the singing communists in which communists are being burned at the stake and they look beautiful and the Nazis are laughing. But anyway, there's a museum in uh, Minsk that uh, is mostly his works. And uh, he would often be seen there. I didn't meet him. I just met people who loved him and buy that book every time I went there to give to people here. And one of the people I sent a copy to, by the way, was Herman Wolk, who I corresponded with uh, several times back in the 80s. He's the author of uh, Cain Mutiny, Winds of War, and War and Remembrance, and plus 25, 30 other books. But he's a great guy. He lived to 103, died just a couple years ago. Amazing man. Wow. But his parents were, they were from Minsk, so he loved the book. Oh, I hadn't realized he'd, he'd, he'd come from uh, the Soviet Union, or his parents had. Yeah, yeah, very interesting to me, too. Yeah. And he's such a, you know, I loved uh, King Newton, he's uh, really, and both the other ones, too, The Winds of War and War and Remembrance. And the... What sort of impact do you think your work or your travels had on the Cold War and and people's views of the Soviet Union? It took time, but I I really felt like we, it's not just me, there were a few people like me there. I don't know anybody that was uh, connected to Radio Moscow like I was, uh, but there were other people who I knew or learned about and met. Sometimes I met them by accident in the Soviet Union, but there were people who were on a similar mission with very uh, good intentions. And uh, I think many of us had a big effect. I was told by editor of the Daily Paper here in in Minnesota that when he wrote, he wrote a letter or he wrote an editorial when Gorbachev was in Minnesota and he said, and I talked to him about it. He said, well, I was thinking of you, Robert, when I wrote that, that how many Minnesotans had a uh, an effect on the Cold War. And uh, he hoped that we were introduced to Gorbachev. And I wasn't. I was babysitting my daughter. My wife was in Minneapolis when Gorbachev was here. And the big hit they made was they had a Soviet flag. You know, my Soviet flag. My Soviet flag got around a lot. It's in in newsreels and magazines uh, of the time because I was the guy that thought of bringing it, you know, that and an American flag. I used to put the Soviet flag up front of my house when I had Soviet guests and neighbors were friendly about it. I had a a sheriff who uh, I asked him to come meet some ladies that were visiting. They were school principal and a teacher and they reported that the biggest thrill they had was meeting the sheriff who lived on the block from me. <laughs> I had the vision of some guy turning up on a horse with a star badge on, yeah, I presume. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> he did have a, a great uniform, though. I mean, it was a great... And I don't know. I, my, I've i always found it's true about uniforms. People do look at you in a uniform, and there's a reason for it. And, uh, and I had a uniform on so much of my life, the Air Force and the post office. Yeah. These days, postal workers are not necessarily wearing a uniform, which always disappoints me. Guys in t-shirts and shorts and tennis shoes. 
yeah in the, in the united states yeah i i understand that you also went into soviet schools and talked about the u.s there as well yep i did that uh i always remember the first one i think i posted that picture of the school and that was the first time i did it uh, and the kids were waiting for their guest and uh I went in and they had somebody translating for me and a lot of kids would speak English very well, which was always fun, you know, that you, I could communicate with kids that way. And another picture I published uh, or put on your website was, uh, I call it uh, my first interview in Moscow, with these boys with hockey sticks. <laughs> and I love those boys. It was such a great experience for me. I would have only been in the Soviet Union for a short time, and I was out taking a walk, and there they were playing on ice, and uh, I asked them if I could take their pictures to take back to the United States, and uh, and they asked me questions about the United States, and they asked in English, and we had a good 15-minute session with laughter, and one of the most pleasant things that happened. Yeah, those are great, great photos you've got of those boys. They really, because they look right into the camera and you can see that there are a number of characters. Um, I know, yeah, there. different types, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, uh, there's a picture of the kids that threw a snowball at me, which I enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know who I was. Yeah. I mean, it going into a, a Soviet school as an American, it, you know, for, for, I would have thought for Soviet school kids, that's a bit like an alien coming into land in, right. in, yeah, in their exactly. school. So they, they must have yep, been that's... really interested in, in hearing what you had to say. Oh, they did. They, they were a great audience. And so it, it happened here too. I mean, as I think I mentioned, uh, at least 200 times I went to uh, schools in Minnesota and talked to uh, kids about Soviet Union. What I would do was, uh, before I started using video, I showed slides and I made the slideshow real quick. It would just be like three minutes, the, the length of a song. And I played the song, the Russian folk song, along with the slides and I'd show them quickly. And that would just give me a barrage of questions. I didn't have to work very hard to decide what to talk about because the pictures caused the questions. Same thing with my father. I showed my father those pictures, the same pictures that we're talking about here. And he was deeply hurt by them, and it damaged his view of the Soviet Union, and uh, it made him very angry with me. And uh, that was just not too many years before he died. I never really got a chance to talk to him about uh, World War Two. He was. I loved your interview of your father, and I would have loved to have interviewed my father about his war experience, but he never talked about it. He, but he did, his lessons were taught to me, you know, about racism, for instance. He learned about, or he had met so many black people, and he was going to make sure that his kids were not racist. Another person I wanted to mention that I met was... Uh, Svetlana Staridonskaya, who was kind of the face of uh, Vremya news in uh, Moscow in the 80s. She was on every night, uh, and I had seen her before I met her. Uh, she came to uh, Minnesota for the peace cruise, and uh, she uh, was on the boat. She filmed it for Soviet television. I went, or she was on, uh, and that caused her to make a connection with local television here and she came back later and worked for a local tv station uh as a news reader or not she made reports for the local station and also to send back to moscow and at that time my wife was uh working with channel or the channel that she was on helping them with svetlana she was kind of like a just a helper. My wife was really good at it. Most fun I had with her was she appeared on Johnny Carson's show as a guest, and she was introduced as the Barbara Walters of the Soviet Union, which 
she certainly wasn't. She was much more fun than Barbara Walters. And you'll see her picture too. I put her picture on. Yeah. Uh, is on. Uh, and uh, went to her home for dinner. And one of the interesting stories was she interviewed Graham Greene before she interviewed me. And she told me about it. I didn't know who Graham Greene was. I had to look it up to find out about that. That was interesting for me, you know. Did you uh, do any broadcasts from Radio Moscow as well? Or was it that you were interviewed? Well, yes, I was, in, I was interviewed a number of times in person. And then also I was, uh, I made programs for them. or Not programs, I interviewed them, Americans. I'd, that was part of my school visit sometimes I would have my trusty tape recorder and uh, I would play them a tape of uh, Russian kids asking questions of American students. And then I would record their questions and their answers. And those shows were broadcast over Radio Moscow. And it, 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 the um, I helped name the show Radio Bridge. And uh, it resulted in Satellite uh, TV connections, too. There was a Peace Child uh, play that was uh, done here in, in Minnesota and in Moscow, and that resulted in all kinds of successful contacts. When you were in the Soviet schools, can you remember what the most popular question for you would be? What do Americans think of us? Right. <laughs> and was it the yeah. same way when you went in an American school? Well, it can be. It could be. One of the real big misconceptions uh, and, and shameful things about American knowledge is uh, there are a lot of people who don't know the difference between a Nazi and a communist. I remember when I was a kid, you know, I would look at the hammer and sickle and I, I didn't know what a sickle was. I knew what a hammer was, but a sickle looked like something that would cut you and it looked dangerous. And uh, my parents were afraid of the Soviet Union. And I was until uh, I started learning. I remember a communist once, an American communist told me, well, what are the hammer and sickle there? The tools of a working person. Is that anything to feel bad about? <laughs> You were saying that I think you did six trips and then you you had to stop because it was just taking too much of a strain for you. It was, yeah. I quit. And also I quit at, at the same time the red flag came down over the Kremlin. I felt like, well, I've accomplished. I didn't, I didn't want to pull the flag down. I wanted to end the Cold War, but the, they said the Cold War is over. I don't think it was and I certainly not now but uh, I felt like yes I was really a part of it and uh, one of the articles about me that was written somebody said and he's he's not ashamed to tell you that that he thinks he gave millions of dollars worth of work to the cause and I I feel like I did I feel like my wife and I were you couldn't buy what we did for for multi-million dollars it just was so many little successes you know all these you know, we had a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, public ask, access TV in America. You People can, a lot of towns have, you can go down and record a program. And I did some really good stuff. And I had some recordings I did uh, with professional equipment that wasn't mine. It was in a studio. I had a really good studio available to me. And I ran the the controller, you know, where you control switching cameras like they had. Actually, one studio had three cameras. And so, I mean, I was really proud of that stuff. And it got around a bit. People would ask for it, and we'd send it to various cities around the country and make copies of it. So in, in 1989, you decided to leave the Communist Party. Why, why was that? Yep. Best explained by a recent experience where I went to a Communist Party meeting about three years ago, just because I hadn't been to one for 25 years or something. And I thought, well, let's let's go see what it's like. Maybe they'd like to hear my story about things I know about that I never told them. One of the, the host was an old professor from the University of Minnesota who welcome Joe Adamoff to the University of Minnesota. So he was a, kind of a special friend to me, but he was a real old timer. 
or he is an old timer. I sat there and uh, chatted with people for a while. I was there before anybody. I was there on time. Nobody showed up till about 20 minutes late, which irritated me. After the chatting for another 10 minutes, they started the meeting. And the first topic of discussion was when to have the next meeting. And that discussion went on 20 minutes before I walked out. I just couldn't stand all the thinking you had accomplished something because you wrote a sentence or something somewhere. And yeah. uh, and yet, I knew glorious, wonderful communists in the United States, uh, all of whom are dead. There's still some really good ones, too. I I know a guy who lives not far from me who super good man. A lot of sympathy for my attitude. <laughs> He's yeah. still a yeah, yeah. I guess it's, you know, it, it's tricky because obviously some people will view that what you were doing was supporting a country that was an enemy of the United States. Right, which is easy for me in that I, I know it. It never was an enemy. And uh, uh, it, was, it was wrong for us to make out that we were enemies like that. I mean, uh, I, in my opinion, uh, the Nazis could not have been defeated without the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, of course, could have failed without the United States stepping in and all the other countries that did. I mean, everybody else, I mean, the UK was just so devastated by it. Another thing, people in the United States don't know the ratio of of uh, casualties uh, is so much. I mean, it's just I can't remember. It's less than half a million. Like four hundred thousand Americans died in the war. Yeah. No, I think you. I think you're right about the uh, the 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 Soviet war effort. I guess it's you know when it gets post war and. You know, things like the Berlin blockade, the Hungarian uprising, and then Czechoslovakia in, in 1968. Um, right. I mean, what, what were your views on, obviously you weren't, you weren't, you probably weren't. No, born, I was uh, two years, that was before my time. Yeah. And, uh, and when I look back at it, I certainly sympathize with the, those countries, although I was, I was kind of angry with, uh, the Baltic states for breaking up, being one of, among the first to break away from the Soviet Union, Lithuania and Latvia. And I had I had very warm feelings about those that those places, and that was one of the beauties of the Soviet Union to me was all the they there was so much positive propaganda of encouraging people to love each other and respect each other, and you had cultural. Uh, um, events, for instance, the tourist agency in tourist, we would have uh, Lithuanian Day, and they, we'd have speakers tell us about Lithuania, and we'd have Lithuanian cuisine, and it was nifty. Well, I used to tell people one of the things that I loved was the effect of getting away from advertising. And when I went to the Soviet Union in '84, it just I, I just was overwhelmed with the peace and quiet, you know, of, uh, in some ways you would think, uh, I guess a lot of people, maybe most people would feel like it was bad that you turn the radio on and you had a choice of two channels, you know, and one would be talking and one, one would be classical music. And, uh, there was no advertising on television and, uh, television was full of, uh, attempts at positive to make people feel good, I guess, is what you'd call it. That's not the way to make people feel good is with pictures. The way to make people feel good is to give them uh, uh, concrete uh, improvements. I just sp- spotted a picture I'm going to send to you. It's a picture of my daughter with two Soviet dancers. It's just my all-time favorite picture of my daughter uh, as a oh. child. Did you send me one of your daughter with Dean Reed as well? Yeah, that's the one where uh, she's on his lap here in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that that's a that's a great one too. I recorded. There was a, a local uh, public TV program that was once a week, and they 
obtained uh, recordings from the Soviet uh, satellite of Soviet news. And it was so interesting to Minnesotans that they showed it every week. They would have a 10 minute segment where they showed the Soviet TV. And then they'd have a, the local expert talk about it afterwards. And I recorded those programs and I brought them to Radio Moscow and they were excited about it. Uh, they got around to Soviet TV, what have you. Uh, and uh, it was just something that they didn't know. I was frequently shocked at how little, how the, the gaps in official Soviet knowledge of what goes on in this country. I mean, things they didn't understand. Mm. And that was one of the things that I'd be asked questions about by journalists. They'd ask me questions about American television. Or how do I, how do people know anything about us and, and that? Yeah, I think, and, and I think that that sounds like, you know, your main mission was breaking down the barriers between the two countries and trying yes, to yeah. explain the thinking and the way of life in each country to uh, each other. And we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters, help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.